Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Christians and Cocktails. Uh, sorry we couldn't go live tonight. Uh, apparently, there's something in the internet world that just was prohibiting us from actually doing that. But uh, we decided that since we were all here, we're going to record this and put it up anyway, somewhere, somehow. So that's just how uh, all the ancestors are working with us tonight, uh, as far back as John Smith. So uh, we're going to make this happen, and John Smith is going to guide us through this process tonight. Uh, we'll let you more, let you know about John Smith a little bit later. But, Isn't it but Joseph we're, Smith? Oh, Joseph Smith, not John Smith. <laughs> John Smith, isn't he the Pocahontas guy? Yeah. <laughs> Just around the river bend. Just oh, around the river bend. Oh. So there I go. So much for, for that. At least I got the Smith in there. <laughs> so anyway, since we recorded this and uploaded it, just a reminder, Monday through Saturday, we do midday prayer every day at noon. Uh, of course, there's Wednesdays, there's a share in the chair with our senior minister and the guest. And on Saturdays, there is just a thought with uh, Darrell Watkins and Cindy Lippert. And of course, on Sundays, we welcome you to join us for uh, in-room worship at 9 and 1030 a.m. And we also uh, live broadcast the 1030 service on uh, Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, hopefully Facebook will be much more cooperative come Sunday than it is on this Monday night uh, for Christians and Cocktails. That said, let's get into it. And welcome back to everybody. Ooh, okay, sorry, that was my, yeah. my heart pounding because it's thundering here. So, you know. Here too. Okay, let's do this, Darrell. <laughs> um, just because we have electronic devices in our ears, I don't think there's anything to be worried about. Uh, and I'll, and P.S., uh, Wednesday, uh, share the chair. Our uh, guest is uh, Reverend Linda Pantoya. Yay. Is that right? Is yes. that right? Yes. Okay, because you look like, I don't know. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know another one? I don't know. Okay, so that. <laughs> I, <laughs> so, yes, our, our own. Metaphysician slash interfaith minister, uh, Linda Pantoy is our special guest on Wednesday. So uh, she, only, she only gets like one question a night, but she, she gets a whole 40 minutes or so on Wednesday, just her. So tune in for that. All right. Sorry that we're late, although it's even so much later by the time you hear me say that. It's um, technical issues, whatever. Uh, and most people watch it at their convenience anyway, but for the 50 or whatever that that would watch it at, I'm sorry. Um, but it's beyond our control. So here's how the game is played. Um, we are, uh, we have questions that we collect. Sometimes they are from the panel. Sometimes they are from viewers. Sometimes they are random. Uh, sometimes we see like just some amazing question asked by someone else to someone else, but it was a good question, so we appropriate snatch, um, and we just throw it in the queue. And then uh, on Monday we distribute them amongst um, our panelists, and they ask, and we discuss, and you get to chime in on the thread. Not so much tonight, sorry, but usually you get to chime in, ask your own questions, uh, make your own comments, follow up questions, all of that sort of thing. So. Um, because we're not live, it's, it's just going to be us tonight, but we do have plenty of questions. So let's get to them. And we do have a, uh, a drinking word. Every time anyone says Kate Smith, we all have to drink. So that's the, uh, Kate Snow it, maybe? It's not, it's not, it's Who's not Kate. Kate. Smith? Exactly. <laughs> Who is Kate Who Smith? Is Kate Smith? Charlie's God Angel. bless America. Kate Smith. Oh Charlie's my goodness. Angel? What? <laughs> Charlie's Angel. Oh, no. oh <laughs> the original or the or the, or the return? <laughs> Let's I just think, drink. Let's just I drink. think I think she <laughs> was Cheers. some important lady in the uh, in the early Mormon movement. <laughs> 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 she was she was Joseph and John's favorite great aunt. I think that's who Kate Kate Smith was. That was Lucy <laughs> Mack. Oh, that was Lucy Mack. <laughs> Lucy Mack Smith. Y'all don't want to get started on Mormon <laughs> genealogy, okay? It's real, real crazy. That's a long line of stuff, huh, Sam? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So, uh, because she's been away on business and family matters for what seems like months, let's have uh, Reverend Linda uh, kick us off. What is, what is a question that you have for us, uh, Linda? Yes. So what is the difference between new age and new thought? 
Who laughed? Who laughed at this? Somebody laughed. The same difference between John Smith and Joseph Smith. <laughs> I think that was our drinking word. Yes. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Anytime Smith comes up, Granny Smith, any Smith, it's a drink. Stop <laughs> saying <laughs> Smith. <laughs> so anyway, um, so New Age, the New Age uh, was supposed to be the age of Aquarius. And uh, so that was the... Uh, astrological whatever and so uh, it was the new age um and there was remember the song from hair you know the dawn this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. that would have been in the late 60s I'll, although i think of full on the age is supposed to be in the early 80s and then i forget how long an age lasts it's like millennia i mean it's a long time so and the age of Aquarius, each each age has something to do with the sign that that represents it so uh, uh, Aquarius is the water pourer who holds the pitcher and pours the water, um, but doesn't get her hands wet. And she, she's holding the thing. Uh, and so the age of Aquarius is where, and it's kind of bearing out with the nuns and the, uh, and the exiles and, and uh, all of that and, and the new religions, it, that the age of Aquarius was to be where we sort of all become our own priests and shamans, which is a Protestant, you know, the priesthood of all believers thing anyway, right? So the water pour, pouring the, pouring the water um, for herself. And so that we were all going to be spiritual seekers, but not as tied to dogma and tradition and institutions as before. Um, poo poo if you want to, but that's the way it seems to be working out. <laughs> you know, just really. Um, so, that, so that was that. Now, because of it's an age of spiritual exploration, you see all, you know, crystals and yoga and uh, astrology and numerology. So it's, it's, it's just all over the place. There's not, there's not a, you know, reincarnation and, and the Pleiadians and uh, what, what, what's the lost continent, Atlantis. All of that stuff is grouped into the, uh, into the new age because it, it's just about exploration and trying new things and seeking your own path and, and um, in this new age. So that's new age. Uh, it's a metaphysical, obviously, outlook. And because it's metaphysical, uh, there are some uh, similarities with new thought. So new thought has a very different story. New thought didn't have anything to do with the dawning of a cosmic or astrological age. New thought began in the mid 19th century as a healing movement. Uh, it later spread to other things like, okay, if you can heal your body, maybe you can heal your psychological issues. If you can heal your body and mind, maybe you can heal your finances. And if you can heal your mind and body and finances, maybe you can heal your relationships and so on. So it was a healing movement. And it came on when medicine still was not that great. And so um, uh, people would turn to it uh, rather than have some sort of draconian surgery uh, or uh, some sort of invasive thing. Uh, I mean, now there's like laser surgery and you're in a sterile environment. That is not the way it always was. <laughs> and so uh, having an alternative was very, very important. Uh, it, having an alternative, the results could be as good or better than doing the medical stuff uh, at that time. Uh, if your choice was between a prayer treatment and a leech, well, you know, um, prayer treatment, prayer treatment one. So, but it, but it was a healing thing and it was about, because God is a presence, not a person, but a presence, uh, some would say a mind, that as we redirect our thinking and learn to think differently, we are, we are letting the one mind operate through us instead of trying to operate a separate mind. Uh, what we think of as us, as our little selves, that's, that's ego. And ego is fear-based, and it's hard to thrive when you're in fear. So as we, as we identify with the one mind, the divine mind, that which is whole and perfect and everlasting, then we are aligning with that better kind of thinking and we have fuller, better, better lives. So it, it was about the mind power. Uh, some, of the, some of the movements that came out of it were called mental science, science of mind. There's also unity and divine science and homes of truth and church of truth. But it was all sort of a, a mental thing about how to think differently, how, how, how to change your perspective. And then as you do that, uh, you are tapping into, into innate powers, uh, powers of mind that can 
benefit your, your whole life. So they're both metaphysical approaches, but one is sort of uh, just this wide, broad net of, of trying all kinds of things, uh, whereas the other started out specifically as a healing movement and trying to utilize one power, and that is the power of a divine mind that our minds are part of. And so it's, it, they, aren't, they aren't really the same thing at all. They, they have different, uh, they started in different ways and uh, for different reasons, but because they're both metaphysical, there is some overlap every once in a while in, in the thinking and, and the language of them. So that's what I would say about the difference. Now we have other metaphysicians on the panel, so they may have different perspectives. Please chime in. And if they don't, I have something to say. I, I thought New Age was um, tomorrow when Ro uh, Robert turns 53. That's a New Age. That is a New and Age. What happens when I drink? I get a new thought. <laughs> you get a new so, thought. Am I wrong? Yeah. You are. There's more to the story. I won't say you're wrong, but there's more to the story. Oh, okay. okay, okay. <laughs> Happy birthday, Robert. I don't know if you can see my side eye or not. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, Linda and, and actually, Linda, you, you, you first. Uh, since you study multiple paths, uh, I'm sure you can, you can make what I said better. So please do. I would need a couple more drinks for that. <laughs> Someone say Smith. <laughs> <laughs> no, I basically that's that's uh, that's what I know too, right? That uh, New Age is more about it includes new thought uh, as it relates to the metaphysical aspect of it and and trying to be and remain positive, uh, but then it includes the uh, use of crystals and pyramids and rocks and astrology and all of that, which really New Thought doesn't condemn, but doesn't really sponsor it, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, new Thought is more about uh, healing your mind and changing your thoughts. Yeah. to change your life. Uh, Margarita, the, uh, what camp, because I, I could see an argument for, for either, what camp does A Course in Miracles go in? Because the philosophy as it's taught seems perfectly new thought, but the, the origin story of how it came to be seems a little new age. So, exactly, uh, so I would <laughs> think it's a little bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> you would think it's a little bit of both. I think, um, you know, the true, the fundamentalist of uh, Course in Miracles will say it's totally different and it doesn't go into any of the categories. But, um, you know, we're, we can just say that it has a little bit of both because of that, what you said, you know, because, you know, it has uh, that piece of that um, healing of the mind because it's really about healing of the mind, like new thought. And I think it, it aligns probably a little bit better that way. But, mm -hmm. You know the how it comes about. It's a little bit more of a mystical type of thing, right? You have to believe in it. Too. Yeah, right. <laughs> but and we have to believe in everything we say, right? To, yeah. To go for right. it. So, and of course, Sunshine Cathedral. We're a we're a little universalist. We're a little Protestant. We're we're a little mystical. We're a little New Thought. We're we're, we're sort of all of it. Um, a little charismatic, I guess, a little, little new age. We're, I mean, whatever, whatever you bring that's good and beautiful, we'll try to work it in. But uh, the philosophy, the, 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 the way we approach theology and teach theology is mostly new thought. But uh, we're not really against anything. So uh, any honest search for truth and fulfillment, uh, as long as, you know, we, we are kind of against being against stuff. So if you're like, if your philosophy is about being mean to other people, okay, we're not going to buy into that. But otherwise, uh, you know, bring, bring, bring what you want to the potluck and we'll sample it. Uh, now, if people go back for someone else's uh, macaroni salad rather than for your, you know, carrot and raisin salad, well, that's just people's preference. Don't be mad. But uh, you can bring everything to the, to the, to the potluck. 
All right, so that's good. That's, let's, uh, I'll try to get one per household and then we'll go back. And that way if we run out of time, I don't know how we're gonna run out of time, because uh, I don't remember exactly when we even got started. But anyway, uh, Tito, ask us something. <laughs> let's see. Why don't you teach that Jesus died for our sins? Ooh. <laughs> like I said, Tara, ask Don't us something. <laughs> Why do you believe that, that Joseph yeah. Smith died for our sins? <laughs> <laughs> what was it, Jesus Smith? Jesus Smith. Jesus Smith. <laughs> wow. You almost lost Tito on that one. Almost lost Tito on that one. Girl down. Um, okay, so why don't I teach that Jesus died for our sins. All right. Uh, because I don't believe in it, I don't want to lie about things. So <laughs> just that. That's the short answer. That's the short answer. Um, and I mean, I can nuance it. I can try to nuance it for people. Uh, you know, Dr. King died for the sin of racism. That doesn't mean his purpose on earth was to die. He, he, didn't, he wasn't born just to die. Uh, he, he didn't shuttle down from heaven just to... Uh, uh, just to be shot in Memphis. Uh, and yet, because he confronted uh, classism and racism and war uh, and uh, agitated people who liked all those things, um, he was killed. So he, he was willing to risk his life for a cause and then he died in advocating for that cause. So you could say Dr. King died for our sin of racism. When we say that Jesus died for our sins, that has become uh, a way of saying that or of understanding or of assuming that God required that, that God required that one person uh, suffer almost uh, unimaginably so that all other persons could be okay, uh, that, that Jesus died to get rid of sin. But if sin is brokenness, if sin is cruelty, if sin is racism, if, if sin is doing things that are not life-giving, things that hurt other people, hurt the planet, uh, then Jesus' death didn't get rid of any of that because we're still looking at all that. So it's so uh, if it was meant to destroy sin, get rid of sin, it didn't work. Uh, secondly, a God that required, and there are mythologies that have gods that do that, that if you sacrifice this child, maybe the crops will come back. Or if you sacrifice this virgin, uh, maybe the rains will come back. Uh, the, the, but we don't usually those don't catch on beyond particular cultures and particular moments of time. And we don't usually uh, lift that up as laudable. Even if the culture had a lot of things going on, you know, oh, they had beautiful architecture and beautiful fashion and, and they, you know, they, they did things way ahead of their time. We never celebrate, oh, and they threw children into volcanoes or into rivers or onto fire pits. And so um, we don't usually laud the gods that require human sacrifice except ours. Um, and when we look at uh, Sikhism and Jainism and Islam and Judaism, uh, Christianity stands out uh, as, as unique in saying that God required someone suffer so that, uh, so that other people wouldn't be eternally damned. It is a cruel, it is, a, it is an obscene uh, theology. Now, it comes from the Middle Ages. It comes from Anselm. Uh, it comes from a worldview that they were trying to communicate the reality of grace, but they were filtering it through their own lived experience. That's what we all do. And so Anselm, who is probably the second most powerful uh, person in his kingdom, knows how kingdoms work, where kings are absolute in their power at that time. And if you offend the king, if you offend the king's honor or dignity, if you break the king's laws, you will wind up in a tower or you will wind up exiled, can't even come back in the country, or you will wind up dead. And so when people are thinking of God as a king, this is how kings act. And so Anselm imagines a way that you could satisfy the king's wrath. And so yes, you, keep, you know, we all offend the king. We, we, none of us keep the laws perfectly. The king should exile us or lock us in a tower or kill us. But there's this way we can get around that. Uh, is that the king will take out all of the king's wrath on this one person. <laughs> and that person agreed to it, and that person didn't deserve it. So it's, it's, it's the exchange. 
that will make us all okay. So as we inherit it and, and embrace it uncritically, it seems cruel and unjust and oppressive. It is an oppressive theology. How it came about was actually meant to communicate the idea of grace. Now, since I don't think of God as a king or even as a person, since God for me is a presence, and it is a presence of perfect and unconditional and all-inclusive and eternal love, that love can't be offended to the point that it would reject you or torment you or, or, or cut you off. Uh, and that love would certainly, being love, never require someone to be treated unlovingly so that everyone else could be loved. So my theology, because I'm not starting off with a king whose dignity must be protected at all costs, atonement doesn't even make sense. I also see in the scriptures that Jesus knew, what we call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, that um, the prophet Isaiah is saying, wash your, hand, your, your hands are bloody from these animal sacrifices. This isn't what God wants. Wash your hands clean. Stop with, stop with the sacrifice. This is the sacrifice I want from you to treat widows uh, decently, to make sure that orphans have a place to live and have enough to eat. So the sacrifice that the prophet Isaiah said wanted was kindness and mercy and generosity, not killing animals. We also remember uh, Abraham and Isaac, Abraham willing to kill his own son. And he thought God required it, but actually God is the one who keeps it from happening. You, know, you shouldn't have to kill your own, your own child. And so God provides a ram for him to kill instead. Uh, I don't think God gets jollies out of rams being killed either, by the way. But that story, I think, is over against the other religions that do practice child sacrifice. And so this is to say we are different than those religions. We don't sacrifice our children. Our God does not require human sacrifice. Uh, the prophets who took on the prophets of Baal, the prof the, the, uh, some of those uh, religions uh, practiced all kinds of sacrifices. The cult of, of Molech uh, practiced human sacrifices. And so the prophets of Yahweh were very different. And in the battle, it was the over against, showing how one is different than the other. So the religion of Jesus, the religion Jesus practiced, the religion Jesus knew, the scriptures that Jesus knew, repeatedly sort of steer us away from that theology to begin with. So it's a break from, from the Jewish Jesus' own theology to say that the Jewish God and the Jewish Jesus were in on some sort of death pact for the rest of us to be okay. It, doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, it certainly doesn't seem uh, loving or kind or decent or necessary. And um, so I don't need Jesus' death to redeem me. I've spent my entire religious life so far trying to redeem the image of God, a God that would require that. And so God is love and love does not require death to, uh, to be in loving relationship. Uh, so that's why, that's why I don't teach it because I don't believe it. And, uh, and I think that the theology itself has, has done a lot of damage. Uh, I think it was Thomas Paine that said, belief in a cruel God makes a cruel person. And we see that. We have, we have, we have evidence of that. Um, uh, what was her name? Green, something green. Oh, it just went out. Of, I think it was Joseph Smith Green. No, it was something green. Um, Anna Green. Anyway, she wrote a book. In the green campus. She was she was a Methodist and she had some she was bedridden for like a year. And so just out of boredom, she read the Bible. And as she read the Bible, really, for the first time, she was kind of horrified. And uh, and so she became an agnostic or a humanist or an atheist, something like that, and really started criticizing those parts of the Bible that had been taken uncritically and applied mercilessly. And she said, using the language of her, of her time and understanding, she said, if we, will, if we will see that a father requires the sacrifice of his son and call that good, whatever would we call reprehensible? And, um, and I just, I disagree 100% with that. So, um, so yeah, I don't teach it because I don't believe it. So I don't think it's true. And if I thought it was true, then that God would be so monstrous to me, I would have to resist that God. If I thought that God were, were real, then that God would be demonic and evil. And we would, as good people, have to resist the demonic and the evil. 
But I don't think God is demonic and evil. I don't think God is insane. And so I don't believe that. So I don't preach it. I preach God is love. And Jesus was killed the same reason the other people that day were killed on that same hill, because the government killed them. Systems of, of oppression killed them, not, not God. Uh, the God part is in the story where Jesus' death doesn't end the story, where there's more to the story. There's, there's hope even after hopelessness. Uh, there, there's beauty even after ugliness. There's newness after what seemed to be the end. That's the God part. The death part was cruelty. The death part was nothing good. But that there's more to the story, that's the God part for me. And that's what I celebrate, and that's what I teach. We have other theologians on the panel. Jump in, somebody. I have a question. Okay. I have a couple, but I'll start with this one. <laughs> do you, so do you think that if um, Jesus's death wasn't as horrific as it was, that he would be as influential as he is? Buddha died at the age of 80 of, of food poisoning, and we're still talking about him. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I don't know how it would have played out differently because it didn't. Um, but I know other, I mean, Lao Tzu, whose name means old man. I mean, Lao Tzu uh, lived to be old, if he lived at all. He, he may have been a bit myth mythological, but uh, if, if there were Lao Tzu, he was old, apparently. And uh, so, yeah, I don't think you have to be cut down in your prime. Jesus and King were Dr. King. I mean, it, it certainly adds to the drama and to the, the emotions. Uh, but there are also people who live to be, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh is still hanging on, unless he's died during the course of this conversation. He quit eating weeks ago. Uh, I think it might sometimes be hard for holiness just to drift away. I think people are just need it so much, they're just soaking it up. And so you can't let go, maybe. But uh, Thich Nhat Hanh is in his 90s. And he is revered. He's been revered since he was in his 20s. And uh, I don't think we're going to forget about him after he makes his transition. So I don't know. I, I, I mean, that's the answer. I just, I don't know. But I, I don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's absolutely necessary for someone to be cut down early in life to be memorable. Uh, but how Jesus's story would have played out differently, I, I don't know. I, do, I had a priest one time tell me that it was liturgically very lucky for us that Jesus was crucified instead of stoned because this is so much more graceful than this. Uh, that. <laughs> I know we lost wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> For this. Will Smith, John Smith, Mary Smith, Eddie Smith. Granny Smith. Smith. That's a Granny Smith. Right Granny there. Smith. <laughs> Smith family. So oh, if you don't believe that Jesus died for our sins, then you don't believe that we need to be redeemed from sin. No, 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 I do not. 100%, no, no. And let me tell you why. Um, the, uh, to be, that goes back to Augustine, this idea that we fell from perfection and have to be lifted back up. That we have to be saved. We have to be rescued from this muck and mire that we fell into. That uh, is not how we understand life at all. We understand life to be an ongoing progress, an evolution. And so it's not that we have fallen from perfection, it's that we haven't yet reached it. We get closer and closer and closer. If there's a perfection to reach, maybe better and better and better is, is, what, is all that ever happened. But there was not, it wasn't that we were perfect and then we fell from perfection and now we need something to dig us out of that, out of that mess. Uh, we started out simple and we are evolving to be more and more complex uh, and better and better. And so, yeah, I, I don't believe that we need to be fixed or rescued uh, or redeemed. Although redemption for me means affirmation. Um, so like when you redeem soda bottles, you were, you were claiming their value. So when I think about redemption, when I think about people being redeemed. I think about their value being affirmed. So when I talk about the sacred value of all people, that is my idea of redemption. Uh, but that is innate. That, that sacred value is because there is one presence, there is one power, and it is all good, and we are part of it. If there's only one presence, there's no other presence. If there's only one power, there's no other power. So whatever we are, we have to be sort of molded from, shaped from, pressed out of uh, the idea of the one, the one reality. And so we're part of that. Emerson said, I'm part and parcel of God. And so since I am 
since I am thought of and molded by and pressed out of the one thing, which is all good, Danny James says, I believe in one power and that one all good. Um, so we, we are innately good and learning more and more about our goodness and more and more how to embrace that and express that. It's a process. It's an evolution. Um, so I don't think we were there and we fell and then someone had to suffer to get us back. I believe that we are innately good and it is a long process for us to remember, believe and express that. Uh, but that's about learning and growing and praying. And, and, you know, that's, that's not about anybody having to suffer. I just don't, I, I just can't, I just can't get with the suffering, the, the God who wants suffering. That's just, you would suffer anyway. Who, who needs religion for that? You don't need religion to suffer. So if your religion is offering fear and suffering and division and, you could have had all that and slept in on Sunday. So why, why, why go to the trouble? You know, it was so borderlines the whole atonement theology. And, you know, there's that at one meant about all that as well. But as a Baptist growing up, it was always, we are, we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've always struggled with that whole notion that we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus was because what makes Jesus blood any more special than my blood or someone else's blood or, you know, what makes that so important. And so that whole thing just reeks of that, you know, kind of, um, uh, that reminder that we're still overcoming old tapes that we used to play about atonement theology and the blood theology and the redeeming theology. And we're still playing through those, those weeds to find uh, the at one minute that we need to be with ourselves in order to be at one with the divine. So we the, back- um, the, 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 the context is very important too. Uh, the, the people who started referring to Jesus's death as a sacrifice were trying to, redeem his story they were trying to make sense of his death they were trying to save him from victimization right. he had uh, he spent his life giving people their dignity back and they were returning the favor and so the sacrifices from the old time the old when there was a temple and people would sacrifice animals this that the sacrificial animal had to be perfect without blemish and so in trying to make sense of this amazing person's death well he was when he was blameless when he was so good well the sacrifices were good. And so they were trying to use his horrible end as almost a validation of his goodness. And, uh, and that since he lived into, uh, into, he lived into his humanity so much that he expressed something divine. As we follow that example, you know, that can happen for us too. So that redeems us. So they're using these, they're using these old images to try to redeem Jesus. Cause he, like, how could someone so good who helped us so much suffer so badly? Well, if they can make it have some meaning, then that, re- that, that lifts the shame and that sort of gives Jesus his dignity back. And so that, that's, that's where, that, that's where they, that came from. Uh, so why people did what they did matters. And it's also this blood sacrifice, blood sacrifice. It is innately misogynistic. And to, to use these scriptures to lift up the blood of Jesus, because the scriptures that we think very differently about now, but those ancient scriptures said that you couldn't touch furniture that a, a menstruating woman had sat on, couldn't even touch it. And while she is having that time, now, she can't touch you. And if you touch such a woman or touch anything that she has touched, you have to separate from the community for a while. Uh, you, you, there are cleansing quarantine. rituals. <laughs> you, you, yes, you have to quarantine. That you, there are cleansing rituals. And so a woman's blood is contaminating. To then suggest that a man's blood is redemptive is one of the most misogynistic theologies I can even think of. That a woman's blood will contaminate you and a man's blood will save you. I'm, I'm not here for it. Tito, and Tar- I think I maybe, I, I, I stepped over someone. Was it Tito? Was it Robert? Who was it? I think it was Dennis. Me. Okay. Okay. Um, no, I, I, I wanted to say almost exactly what you said, but and then add a little different was that this is, a, this is a sacrifice. It was a payment for God's grace. So God's grace was never free. So if <laughs> grace isn't free, then it's not really grace. grace. And, we, and we, we, we struggle with this, and, and we've talked about this many times in this particular show, but also from the pulpit, you say it all the time. So if there had to be a payment, then the grace was never free. 
So uh, it's either one or the other. So we, we can't have it both ways. Um, and yet, again, I, I kind of understand where Tara was coming from. If he didn't die such a tragic death, would we still be talking about him now? We don't know the answer to that. And would we have this religion or this thing that we call Christianity now? Would it be the same? Would it look the same? Would it feel the same? Yeah, we don't know. But. And I don't want to miss that. I mean, Tara threw, threw that out as a throwaway, I think, maybe. But there's something to that notion of quarantine with what was in antiquity and what we're going through now. I mean, I think there's something that's, 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 that's something about that that just kind of it hit me when you said that, Tara. It's like, wow, that's a different concept of what it means to quarantine. And for that reason, what we're doing through now. But that's something to, there's a little bit of a notion to that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to chase that rabbit. <laughs> uh, and remember, even Annal's blood was uh, the, the blood, you know, you would kill these, these uh, animals ritually Ritual. uh, for a sacrifice. But it was for the meat. Uh, you know, the priest would eat the meat. Uh, but the blood itself, like meat, couldn't be rare. Uh, early Christians, uh, th th there was a big debate about whether or not Roman soldiers could convert. Could you? Could could warfare be your living, and then and then be part of this pacifistic, really socialistic movement uh, that was later called Christianity? And so, yeah, the I, bloodshed was bloodshed was was anathema. Of, you couldn't touch dead bodies, uh, and so yeah. I mean, blood was blood was powerful because if you bled out, you died. So they thought that life was in the blood, but also blood uh, was was also uh, scary. <laughs> and so, like, you weren't to eat blood couldn't be in your food. You had so blood was all gone. And so uh, yeah. So the idea that Jesus's blood is magical and good. And that just makes everything okay. It it doesn't even make sense out of the philosophies it came out of, uh, and it certainly doesn't make God look good. And I don't know of anybody who is a better person because of this theology, or or, or lives a happier, more loving life because of this theology. Well, and it's a pretty crazy game of telephone that gets you from there to the Crusades. Right. Oh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Good. Good. Good cross. Yes. Yes. So I was just going to say real quick, um, just a quick comment. Thinking of this as a seven-year-old little Tito listening to that Jesus died for your sins, it automatically gave me this guilt of thinking that every single little bad thing that I did caused what happened to, him, to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Even to this day, even though it happened in the past, it was like, some of what happened to him was somehow my fault. And that was really rough for me to hear as a little kid. Um, I don't know when that left my mind, but I remember thinking that like right when I was reading the question, I was like, oh my God, I used to feel this little guilt inside every time I heard that. Yeah. And my little, my little thought now is like, we know more about Jesus than Jesus knew about us. You know? <laughs> <laughs> There's that. Well, I think we're um, we're almost out of time, but I don't think we've heard. I mean, we've heard from everybody, but I don't think we've heard a question from uh, from Samara, uh, the household Samara. So, uh, is there a question that one of you, I don't even care which one, uh, wants to ask? Well, Tara had her follow up question. Then. Yeah, I asked a couple follow-up questions. So, Sam, if you want to ask, you can. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, well, this kind of goes with it. Do you believe in the literal physical resurrection of Jesus? Assuming the answer is no, isn't such a belief a requirement to be a Christian? Wow. Oof. Smith, 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 Smith. <laughs> As I said earlier, Jesus spent his life giving people their dignity back. Uh, when his was taken, they returned the favor. So uh, some people were trying to make sense of it all by saying, well, he was a sacrifice. He was, a, he was perfect, like a, like a perfect sacrifice. And uh, so that adds some purpose to the event. Others uh, would say, uh, well, yeah, they did this terrible thing to him, but it didn't work. He didn't stay dead. Uh, and that not only gave Jesus his dignity back, but it also encouraged other people who could get into similar trouble. The worst they can do is kill us, and it might not take. Uh, so it was encouraging for a movement 
and it also redeemed uh, Jesus. And so, um, so that's, that's, what, that's what that was. There was also a gotcha moment in there. Uh, the Pharisees believed in the physical resurrection of the righteous at a, time of, a future time of judgment. Uh, the Jesus movement also believed in resurrection. And after Jesus dies, there is a competition for who is going to become the dominant philosophy. Now, remember, there were, there were the Essenes, there were the Zealots, there were the Sadducees, there were the Pharisees, there, the, there's the Way, which is the Jesus movement. There were a lot of movements within Judaism. And, and the, the Way, the Way, the followers of Jesus, followers of the Way, were a messianic movement, you know, thinking that the Messiah, there was, there, there was to be a Messiah, he did come, and we knew it. <laughs> and so there are all of these different uh, schools of thought. And uh, once the empire cracks down on, on Judaism and the movement that's later called Christianity, uh, with, within these dispersed and marginalized movements, who's, who's going to sort of come out on top? And so this debate, these theological debates, the Pharisees, the Sadducees don't believe in resurrection because they don't find any such thing in the Torah. So they don't, you know, they're skeptical about angels. Uh, they're, they're pretty conservative when it comes to miracles. Uh, they have a lot of questions rather than answers about the afterlife. Uh, and they definitely don't believe in any resurrection. As the Sadducees, the Pharisees, they, they believe that there will be, the righteous will be resurrected physically one day. Here comes the Jesus movement saying, oh, we believe in resurrection too, but ours isn't just a belief we can prove it because ha it happened to our God. We've been talking to him. We saw him. And so it's, yeah, we believe in resurrection too, but you should buy into our version of it because we have evidence, uh, our, because our guy has been, not will be, but has been. And so it became a, a sort of a marketing genius thing, really, to say that. Um, and on top of all of that, there is something that happens in storytelling cultures, and that is they use idioms and myth and metaphor and allegory and symbolism. Uh, when we take it literally later, uh, and then we learn to not take it literally, we sometimes think, oh, how smart we are, when in fact, the tellers of the story were never taking it literally. Um, and so this idea that life is forever, the spring always follows winter, that morning always follows night, that God is omnipresent, uh, that we are part of God, we can't, there's nowhere to go away from God's presence. The psalmist said, where can I go from your presence? There's no such place. Um, and so to, to say that we have seen someone not stay dead, is sort of an affirmation of what we've been saying the whole time, is that there is no death. There is one power, one presence. It is life. It is love. It is wisdom. It is everlasting. It is ubiquitous. And so to have these demonstrations of it is just proof of what we've said all along, is that we don't really die. And so um, resurrection redeems Jesus. You know, it gives him his dignity back. Uh, resurrection is a, is a proof in a theological debate that life beyond death happens. And uh, resurrection... Uh, is another testament, testimony that God's life, God's power, expressing itself, living itself in through and as us, is true. That, uh, that no matter what happens, there is still something more real than our physical essence, our physical life. There's something more real, and that can't be touched. It can't be harmed. It, it, it can't be snuffed out. So all of that is, is being said in the story of the resurrection. And so we can believe in resurrection. We can depend on resurrection. We can sing songs about it at Easter. We can celebrate it without ever thinking that dead bodies get back up. I, do, I personally don't believe in a physical resuscitation of Jesus's body. Uh, and yet Jesus lives. Jesus lives in my stories. Jesus lives in my imagination. Jesus lives in our rituals. Jesus lives in this conversation. Uh, Jesus is very alive to me. So resurrection is very real to me, and it, and it can be real uh, without, without, uh, without dead bodies getting back up and walking around. It makes for great movies, um, and I love those movies, but I don't need that to be historically factually true, especially when I don't have any evidence to support it. I don't need that to be true, to be factual for it to be spiritually true. Resurrection is the way of life. 
uh, you know, you bury this acorn, this acorn, and eventually you have an oak tree. And then the oak tree drops an acorn. <laughs> like there's this cycle of life. It's never ending. That's what resurrection says. And I believe in it. I believe in it hundred percent. And, um, and so the story is so true to me and so important to me. Uh, even though, uh, I don't tend to literalize the parlor, the parlor tricks aspect of it. Okie dokie then. Y'all ask it. Y'all need, <laughs> need to speak to it. Somebody else needs to speak to it. Don't hang me out here. Don't, don't, I get, don't let me get all the hate mail. <laughs> what was it, Kelly? Kelly's coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> sweet, sweet Kelly Smith. Kelly Smith. <laughs> Kelly Smith. Bless her heart. Bless yes. our heart. Well, okay, then we, um, we've run out of time. We've not run out of questions, but we have run out of time. And, uh, so Robert, why don't you, why don't you do our, our last round robin? All right. As everyone gets their uh, thought together for the round robin, just a reminder, um, Monday through Saturday, we have our, um, uh, midday prayer at noon. Uh, Wednesday is of course our, uh, share in the chair. We invite you to join us for 6 p.m. for that. And, uh, Saturday at 1230 is, uh, Darrell and Cindy Lippert with just a thought. And in room worship, of uh, course, is 9 and 10.30. Uh, need a reservation, must wear a mask. And also, uh, you can watch us on Facebook as well as YouTube. So let's begin our round robin. And let's start off with uh, Linda. <laughs> Final thought. <laughs> we can't hear you. We can't hear you. can't hear you. We want to hear you. Let's make that happen. Where is Linda? Linda, it's Linda. <laughs> can you hear it? Can you yes. Hear it? Okay, good. Um, we take away, actually, uh, Tito's and, and Sam's questions and Durrell's uh, answers reminded me of a great book uh, called Saved from Salvation from our <laughs> very own Reverend Dr. Durrell Watkins. So it's a reminder to go back and reread it, uh, but yeah, it's that reminder that we don't have to be saved. We are, we are, who we are. We have sacred value, and and uh, we redeem ourselves every time we try to heal ourselves. Right. So. Oh, I love that line. Great. All right, I did this, Dennis, Dennis. Me, 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 me. You, you, so you, you. My, you. my final thoughts are: I have two quick ones. One, happy birthday, Robert. Tomorrow is your birthday. We're happy for you. Oh, happy um, and my second thing is that I am so glad that the whole family is back together because <laughs> I have missed all of you and seeing everybody every week. And hey, we all miss a time or two, but, but having us all together is just, this is, these are the moments that I treasure. So I'm mm -hmm. so glad that everybody's here. Okay. How about it, Sam? Um, I'm glad that Linda brought up uh, "Safe from Salvation" because yeah, this this conversation all kind of kind of brought me back to that too. And before I read that book, um, I had I had an experience where somebody told me that they couldn't be friends with me anymore because they'd gotten saved, and I said, "Safe from what?" <laughs> and they got very offended, but I was serious. I was like, "Safe from what?" And they're like, "Well, I'm, you know." I'm safe from guilt and shame, and now I have Jesus on my side, and I just can't be friends with you. And I was like, well, I'm going to tell you something right now. I'm safe from all that, too. I just don't believe it. <laughs> um, so I, and that's, like, liberated me for my entire life. And I feel really grateful um, that I didn't, I didn't come up, um, I, I came up exposed to religion through my family, but not so immersed in it, um, that, I, that I felt that it was mandatory. Um, and so, um, and so I just, I, I, I didn't have to, I didn't have to go through all that. And there's just so much deconstructing that needs to happen uh, <laughs> to emerge from an experience like that uh, when you have a prophet like Joseph Smith. Um, so, uh, so I, I just feel really fortunate. So <laughs> all right, Tito, after you finish a Joseph Smith drink. <laughs> so cake. I'm just glad I learned to let go of all the bad, negative, crazy stories that I heard when I was a child um, at church at a younger age. And I didn't, like, unlike Dennis, Dennis was, like, in church till he was, like, I don't know how old. Um, yeah, but I left the church probably, like, 13 or 14. And 
Um, I think I started developing my own religion in my head um, that worked for me. And so I, I think I'm rethinking religion now that I'm at Sunshine Cathedral and I appreciate everything that you guys do in the program that, that you guys have put together. And, and Christians and Cocktails is a learning experience for me every Monday. So I appreciate that. And then for anybody that is watching, uh, please send in some questions. Uh, you can email it Darrell at sunshinecathedral.net. All right, Tara. All right. Well, y'all are kind of making me feel like one of these things is not like the other tonight because I have to be honest. Is it because you're wearing a white shirt? <laughs> I, am, <I'm> a... <laughs> I didn't even notice that. But thanks for pointing that out. I really am different. Um, it's okay. We love you. I have to be honest, the atonement and the, um, the crucifixion, all that talk, was tough for me tonight because I still have the old tapes playing in my head and I, you know, I just can't help but think like, what if we're wrong? What if, what if, what if we're wrong? And if we're not eternally grateful and indebted for Jesus's sacrifice, what happens if we're wrong? And I know that, you know, that's why I go to Sunshine Cathedral is to, to, um, not think that way and to learn better ways to to think about religion but you know it made me think of something that robert said a couple weeks ago i missed last week but the week before robert said so i think it was from corinthians robert you shared a scripture when i was a child i talked like a child yeah i've been thinking about that a lot the last couple weeks and you know i will say it was very strange for me when i um grew up and I started having my own thoughts and I started questioning. It was very, it was very strange to look at my parents and look at their beliefs and think that I might have something on them. Like I might have a, a something that they don't have. I might have like a higher understanding or I might have like more enlightenment than they have. And that was, that was a really weird moment for me. And I think that anyone that kind of experiences that it's, it's a moment of growth, but it's, it's scary because it's not what you're used to. And you always think that your parents have the answers and that they've taught you the right ways. And so I don't know, I don't know where I'm going, but it's just, I don't know. Well, it's, a, it's a journey, right? Like you're just yeah. you're on your journey. Yeah. Well, and I think well, it's always here to support you on that journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's always great to have more questions than answers. I think that's one of the things we do a lot of. It's like, you know, once you get into the answer part of it, then it's kind of a dead, dead thing. But more questions than answers is always great. I think and chase the rabbit. Yeah. Didn't mean it, didn't and, mean it and I don't ever worry about wrong uh, when it comes to God. I worry about wrong when it, you know it comes to daily stuff. You know, my life. Uh, my, you know, like I get things wrong, but I just don't worry about getting things wrong with God. Uh, that because I do believe in grace. So even if I have gotten everything wrong, if grace is true, it doesn't matter. Mm. Uh, like the worst that I have to deal with is, you know, looking back and thinking, oh, wow, I had, you know, I had 90 years and I fitted them away being wrong. <laughs> you know? So yeah. and that, that would be the worst of it because if God is love and God is, and, and grace is true, then there's no penalty for you know, doing your best and, you know, like there's just no test to fail. And then because you failed, you didn't get to go to college or, you know, whatever. I just, I just, I don't believe that. Now that's, that's my experience. And that's my belief. I can't, I can't impose that on anybody else. But uh, I do say that, uh, of course, we all think we're right. If we thought we were wrong about something, we try to change it. But I don't worry about being wrong because I do believe that God is love and that grace is true. Okay, Margarita, the plane has landed. The exit doors are now open. Get us safely off the plane. <laughs> Let, get, a, get us out of this plane. <laughs> you're muted, I think. I know what you're saying is wonderful, but I would love to hear it. <laughs> okay. There you are. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, you know, the whole conversation tonight um, got me to think just like Tito. At the beginning, when I was a child and I was thought about original sin and, you know, 
confirmation because I needed to like, you know, confirm that I had, you know, the sin and I was okay with releasing it and all this nonsense in my mind. I still was like, what? <laughs> so I think I, I, I was born with something inside of me that knew better. So even though I abided by whatever was said, because I was a child, um, I didn't feel it. <laughs> I was there. I was going through the emotions. I was going through the rituals. But I even remember my confirmation sitting in that class. And it was scrutiny. I was doodling and thinking, like writing questions like, what is this real like <laughs> why is this happening like this and it was like oh am i gonna become them now because i'm just writing this? I'm gonna go. <laughs> no, it was just really surreal for me um and i think that stayed with me all the time and even though i stay in the church for for a long time after college and all but um i always had something that i knew that you know it wasn't it wasn't what they were saying. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm super grateful to have found MCC back in the day in Puerto Rico and, you know, starting to lift uh, all that out of me and, and, and really find a place that was affirming uh, to what I was believing really deep inside of me. And I think, you know, for everyone who's watching and still has like doubts of what they believe is just keeping an open mind. I think it's just uh, keeping an open mind and, and keep listening to, to a, whatever your heart calls you. Uh, because deep down, we know the truth. We just, we know it. And even as a child, I knew it. I couldn't verbalize it. I couldn't really say no to my mother, um, but I knew. So I think at one point we're just gonna make that choice. Yes. Well, all right. Well done. Well said, everyone. Thank you for being with us tonight. And uh, here's to all the Smiths uh, that are out there. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot for joining us. Everyone here Christians and Cocktails. Uh, we will be back on next Monday. Again, you're listening to a recorded session of this tonight. Uh, and we want to thank you for being with us. Uh, and also, as uh, someone has shown up, remember to vote, 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 vote. Uh, and get out and do it. Whatever it takes, just get out and do it. And uh, and we'd love to uh, to uh, have you back with us. I think I see something that's looked like football language coming towards me. B O T C. <laughs> okay, there Sorry. you have it. Get out and do it. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks for being here. It's good to have the whole game back together again, finally. So take care, be well, and we will see you soon. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Uh, Darrell, you have to hit the end button. Where is it? Oh, <laughs> oh, <here> it is. <laughs> Make it stop. Where